welcome to Directly Correct, a people like podcast with Cold Scott. Today's guest, Courtney McMahon, head of global people analytics at Colgate Palmolive. Thanks to our sponsors, One Model. One Model helps people leaders at large organizations make consistently brilliant talent decisions by unlocking the analytical value of the data dispersed across your business. One Model's people analytics platform takes all of the heavy lifting out of data extraction, cleansing, modeling, analytics, and reporting of enterprise workforce data. One Model pioneered people data orchestration and has perfected the ethical use of AI and data science for leaders who need transparent and explainable decision support systems. HR and business teams trust its accurate reports, analyses, and storytelling capabilities. Data scientists, engineers, and people analytics professionals love the combination of governance and flexibility that no other Workforce Insights platform can provide. To learn more, book a demo at onemodel.co slash directionally correct. All opinions are our own and do not reflect those of any other organization. Oh, can I, can I go back for a second? Yeah, please do. Um, I think it would be really fun to do tr model trains. It's probably something I would never end up doing, but I think the concept of building a model train thing would be fascinating. Um, two thoughts here. Um, every year in they have this, this place in Seattle called the Armory. It's it's like a big open. It's, it's an armory. They they used to hold you know weapons there you know during the World War II or whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. But now now it's just like an event space and this sort of thing. They put you know restaurants and whatnot. But every year during Christmas they roll out this massive model train. You can walk around it and it's you know I don't know three hundred feet around or around mm -hmm. the conference something like that. I mean and it's you know got all the sights and say it's cool it's cool and you can kind of even you see children kind of glow I glow you know it's cool it's cool yeah. again, right like I would never go spend two hundred dollars per square foot on a model train set, but I used to be super into aquariums growing up. Actually, you know, I didn't, I think we had, we, I didn't know we shared this. <clears throat> and the one thing my parents would never let me do is a uh, freshwater aquarium. I mean, a saltwater oh, aquarium. Yeah. And so I always wanted one. So I always thought when I get a job and I'm older, I'm going <laughs> to, yeah. you know, get a, get an aquarium. Um, and that never happened, <laughs> but, but that was definitely something I was thinking about. I've Where, is that what your aquarium fascination was like? I had, we, we had an aquarium growing up and it was like, I don't know, probably like a 20 gallon aquarium and it, it went away eventually. Uh, and then when I was in college, a friend gave me his like 60 gallon aquarium and it was really cool design. It's like two feet tall and maybe like four feet wide. And I have a massive uh, placotomous and a massive Oscar in there. Uh, mm -hmm. and then when I moved to Ruston, I got and built a saltwater aquarium and had, uh, uh, two clownfish in there. And that's where, uh, I had a hermit crab named Herman Guinness. <laughs> and that's, that's, uh, the that's, origin story of Herman Guinness. Are, are you into aquariums, Courtney? I, I will say no, but I have had fish in my past. What kind of fish? Uh, those maybe the ones that everybody likes. Oh, are they Japanese fighting fish? Like yeah, koi? yeah. Like koi fish? No, no the, the little small um... ones that look dead when you go into the store and they're always like on their side in those little sad plastic Chinese bowls. Like oh, the Chinese like, a, like a beta. A, a beta fish. Yeah, beta fish. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I have had multiple beta fish. Those kids, it's those kids. I was trying to figure out how you like fish but never had an aquarium, or how you've owned a fish but never had an aquarium. Like, is a beta fish actually fish? I'm not sure. I think it's definitely a fish, but to call that an aquarium is a stretch, definitely. <laughs> yeah, well, it's like you know, you get the goldfish and it's literally in a bag of water. It's like yeah, that's yeah. not that's like a beta, but I guess yeah. I've had multiple bowls going at one time because you can't have those, fish. so there's. Like the equivalent could be an aquarium. And we actually did get a big one. Yeah, actually, I'm lying. We've had the bowls, then we got a big one and had all those like mazes that they could go through and we we're trying to teach them tricks. You know, none of that worked. But yeah, I would, that's an aquarium, right? Something that's more cubicle. I, I, I love um, how you repress this memory too. So. I repress it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's unfortunate yeah. for my, my kids, but that's how, <laughs> that's how it went. They all had timely deaths. Well, Scott had a hermit crab named after a famous professor, Herman Guinness, 
I think uh, I think that's when I kind of came into the conversation. I was like, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I think you have a famous professor in your family too, right? Oh my gosh, good segue. Um, Are we just already? Yeah, we're just here. We're all in. We're We're here. Just doing it. Um, I I do, and and he he is retired now. He retired at the ripe old age of eighty seven. He's eighty nine now, and this is my father, Warner Burke. What's his name? Warner Burke. He taught at Columbia for, or at Teachers College Columbia for many years. I think since 1978. I can't do the math. Go figure. People want to look. The Burke model? Yeah. The Burke Lincoln model. Yeah. So he did a lot of work. A lot of work. And then retired very, very old. But that's that's what people should do, right? You want to keep going. You want to keep learning. There's a curiosity there that I think keeps you interested and also interesting (laughs) never retire just keep going keep going if someone's willing to keep you on their payroll i mean pretty awesome that's one of the benefits of of american academia i would say this is what got you into like org change and org dynamics people analytics in general correct correct i was a consultant though first i'm one of those people that started as a consultant, right? There's so many different disciplines in people analytics. I'm one of the people that started as a consultant, but mainly HR, and then defected a little a little while to do some other things and then came back to the talent space. When I left, when I was gone from the HR space, it then all of a sudden became talent. And yeah. I had to relearn the lingo after having a- HR does that every few years. It's annoying. It doesn't change anything. Come on, guys. Let's get over this. Yeah. Um, I was definitely feeling out of the loop, right? When I came back, I was like, wait, what's, what does talent mean exactly? I thought that was like actresses and actors. It's, it's like people analytics. Like we've been doing this for two and a half years and I've yet to pin down what the fuck people analytics means. Really? Like, sort of like vague ideas. We, we have a podcast about people analytics i don't know i haven't been able to do reliably differentiate it from anything else that's io i think it's unknowable scott i think you're never gonna know <laughs> yeah and actually it wasn't called that right it was called it was actually called talent analytics yeah back in 2010 or 2011 when some people made it up like jeremy shapiro i mean clearly it's not it's not just hr right it's not just hr it's not i guess it's not io i, I don't know I think we like a lot of different disciplines and that's why it's hard to pin down. And then I think like Richard Rosenau has said in the past on this podcast, but then in other places that it's so different at every company even, Mm. right? Because different companies Mm -hmm. have different things underneath the umbrella of people analytics, or maybe even raise it to the next level where it's more of the operations, let's say, um, including HRIS and HR tech overall. Um, the best answer i've ever heard honestly oh my gosh yeah. i feel good about that and i actually i have an article coming out about this in a few weeks um it actually might even be out by the time this podcast comes out but one of the things that we i found in the article was i thought that uh well if you had to guess like what is the most common skill that increased since 2010 in people analytics what what do you think it would be the most common skill um yeah in people analytics. I mean, I know the most common skill that people ask for, and I would think, I think it's, I think it's Python. I think it's one of those coding things. I was very much in that camp. And then what happened? And guess what? It's Microsoft Excel. So, yeah. Ooh. Wait, how do you know that? How do you know that? Because So I did some research with a firm who tracked this over time. And that's okay. what's so exciting about this article. And actually Python and, and R and, you know, SPSS and those, those have actually, they increased and then they've started to decline lately. And I was like, this is fascinating. Really? Oh my yes, gosh, really. this is fascinating. Okay. Do I get a sneak peek of the article? Uh, I'll be talking about it that um, the People Analytics World in New York. So, okay. and you're, you're speaking at People Analytics World in New York, aren't you, Courtney? I am not sure. I am, that is so <laughs> in the air. Me and Barry need to have a chat. Is that proper grammar? <laughs> Barry and I need to have a chat. Somebody and somebody need to talk. Yes, we are. However, you and I are doing some other online virtual HR leader summit. 
I think. Yes. Yeah. We got the HR leader summit. Yeah. Moderating about, you know, the impacts of generative AI and HR and people analytics and get to hear the hot takes from Courtney. So that should be exciting. So we'll, we'll not talk about that today. No, cause I actually don't know what I'm going to say yet. So that's cool. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Well, what, what is going on at, at Colgate Palmolive? I find that to be a very hard word to say, by the way, Palmolive. Yeah. Um, What's going on there in people analytics? Yeah, we have we have to say Colgate Pomala. We've even had to ch change some one of our um, onboarding trainings is called Valuing Colgate People, and we the acronym is VCP. And guess what? Now it's VCPP. Oh, yes, right. got it. Valuing Colgate Pomala people. So. That's hard for that's for hard for some of us, right, to say, but we're starting to get the hang of it. Um, so we're doing a lot, I would say, when it comes to purpose and values and taking advantage of the amazing culture that we have and trying to leverage that to do other amazing, innovative things that every company wants to do, right? We all want to be innovative um, and figuring out where people analytics fits in there and in terms of how to measure. Are we actually making progress? Are we actually moving the needle in terms of innovation? Are we moving the needle in terms of our talent and skills and let's say org design? Um, are we are we actually designing the organization of the future? Who knows the answer to that? I certainly don't. But we do need to measure it, right? We at least need to know. Okay, we're gonna we need to make a decision. We're gonna go in this direction, and then we need to measure and obviously see if it's working. Uh, I do think that there's a lot of you got to use the Burke model. To do. Oh, oh my gosh. You know, thank you for plugging my dad's model. Um, it's very large. Yeah, don't just own your family. Yeah. Have you, have you seen it lately? Like, have you looked at it with fresh eyes? I saw it probably about 18 months ago and it's, it's, it's really okay. complicated. Of course, organizations are rather. It's big ish and has a lot of, yeah, it's really cool. And system structure, culture, uh, external, internal, all the amazing things. Yes. So I do think it's valid to evaluate all of those boxes in the Burke Litwin model, for sure. How many of those do we have actual metrics for? I think it's difficult. Not everyone agrees on those metrics. And that's what I, where I was going to go. Not everybody agrees on the metrics that we can measure our success by, right? So what does success look like? Share, share of price, perhaps, right? Um, EPS, et cetera. But there's so many others. And how do we create that successful outcome measure, I think, is a challenge. Well, I mean, I, this is the criterion problem. I mean, we, we deal with this in IO all the time. And like share price, yeah. like, yeah, we made an org change and our price went up $2. Fantastic. What if it goes down $2? Is that on us? Did we have any influence whatsoever? I mean, there's so many things. Yeah. And does that mean that what we're doing is not good? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Do we feel worse about ourselves? Yeah, I, I think it's really tough. And it's obviously a lagging indicator and longer and so indirectly related and so many other variables and external. That's why um, no one solved it. But I think it does depend on the company. What do you think? Well, what do I think about the criterion problem? <laughs> do you agree that companies should have and probably, I don't know, there's no way to define one outcome? I mean, it depends on your company and what they, I guess what they track, all public companies are tracking something similar, but I think we're very global, we're this size, we're consumer products, right? There's a lot of variables or characteristics. Well, I think you, you, you try to get as proximal as you can and then, you know, use the, uh, um, oh gosh, four steps out. What am I trying to say? Training, training evaluation. Try to like measure it as far out as possible, but you need proximal measures of your outcome as close as you can and then see if you can impact the business as well have like overall metric i think it comes back to like what is people analytics and we can't define that <laughs> and what is performance <laughs> and we can't define that we all agree it exists we all agree that people analytics and performance exist but we can't agree on what it is and so until you can get that agreement you're never going to be able to measure it the way that we would like to Right. I, I have a I have a bias for objective measures, but I understand that you need more than objective measures if you want to holistically understand performance. Yeah. And there there are ROI 
tools, let's say, for people analytics, right? So it's another direction to go down. What is the ROI of people analytics? Um, some of them, I think, are on the conference board. Have you all ever done that or ever, ever talked about that in your podcast? No, we've never. Uh, and uh, Amy, who runs the People Analytics Council and Conference Board, is a friend. And I think I'm speaking there sometime later this year. But uh, uh, no, I don't think we've ever had anybody on from the conference board. There are some online tools, if you're a member, you can leverage. Go ahead. Solange. We've never had anyone uh, really talk about this, but I think Cole really excels at this, like driving value from people analytics. He's got some like really good thoughts on ROI. Dude, I could so mic drop on you guys about some of the stuff that we're <laughs> yeah, doing. It's really good. It's really good. Yeah. But that will be for another day. Just another day. When we study up, we have to study up so I can have a, an intelligent conversation about that. But that is something I think we should get better at. I mean, from an Insight 222 perspective, our, our friends David Green and Jonathan Farrar, they talk mm-hmm. about measuring the value and, and not only creating the value, but measuring and communicating the value all the time, uh, which I think people see the value, which is why this people analytics field is not a fad. It hasn't gone away, which I think we were actually concerned it could have gone away, let's say, right around yeah. COVID, and then COVID happened, and it's only amplified um, and grown since then. Um, and I think there was a lot of, let's say, stress around pr- proving the value. But I think people see the value, even if it's not one metric, right, um, to, to quantify. It's, it's really, um, it's a soft, softer, yeah. like squishier value, plus some harder values. Yeah. Well, Courtney, I mean, you, I think you guys have a relatively, you know, smaller people analytics team, but you're able to punch above your weight because of how you guys apply yourself. What is it that, that wisdom that our listeners can take away about leading that type of team in terms of making an impact? And, you know, are you invest, like, where are you making your investments to be able to do that? People are wearing multiple hats. (laughs) And so I don't know. Such a nice way of putting it. (laughs) I don't know if all of us can excel in all of the hats that we have to wear, uh, but we're trying. And I think we're kind of figuring that out. It also depends on where the company is and where the group is in their journey, right, that you're working with. So we have our team divided into global regions for the most part. Um, and then we also have some more closer to home, let's say corporate focused team members. Um, so I think we've we're spread thin for sure, but we're globally distributed, which really helps. Um, in addition to having, I would say, a core few um, in at the headquarters. So we get that visibility. We have the relationships um, with all of the, not only HR groups, right, which is important for amplifying our analytics, but then also some of the, the let's say, other corporate groups like finance or IT. Um, but we also have our North America headquarters is in New York. So we're, our headquarters, our headquarters, full stop is in New York. It's in the city, uh, the city, by the way. Um, but we also have a couple of the divisions there as well, sitting there. And it's, it's a great place to be. And I think that's one of, honestly, one of the reasons why, even though our team is small, we're able to punch above our weight because we have that exposure plus the global reach. You have expo- exposure, but uh, it sounds like you're able to meet with people in person as well, right? Yes, we do. We are in office. Yeah, we are there, except not today. <laughs> today today we get to see your lovely curtains that match your wallpaper. Yes, I love my curtains that match my wallpaper. Actually, it's a Roman shade, by the way, and it does match my wallpaper. And if you touch them, they are the same fabric. So it's just a seamless design throughout for calm and zen. You, you, have, you have fabric wallpaper? Yeah. Or you just bought it all at the same time? Or maybe you yeah, I sure there. did. I did. <laughs> Doesn't it look cool, though? It looks like a fo- I wanted it to look like a blue forest. You have to be here. Long. Mission accomplished. I mean, totally. <laughs> I'm trying so hard not to make fun. Raise the banner. <laughs> yeah. And I look smart, right? Because I have the bookshelf. That's oh, what I'm yeah. going for. It's more important to look smart than be smart. This is my philosophy. You know, you never get a second chance. To make the first impression. <laughs> well, Courtney, coming That's back to glasses. There you go. Oh, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> uh, Courtney, coming back to your your team for a minute. 
Are you guys invested in any uh, technologies that you use to help scale your team's impact in the organization? Yes. And that is another, I would say, to your first question, what, how we can punch above our weight, right, is because of the scale. So we have a six-person team. Sometimes we have a visitor, so it's seven people um, for periods of time. But the technology is what allows us to scale to the whole HR organization, and that's one model. Um, we've had that since 2020, and it's been, I would say, the best thing that we decided to do because, of course, we tried to build before that, like most companies do. Um, so I have the experience in the trying to build, but then also buying um, one of the competitors to one model at a, another company, but really focused the last four plus years on embedding one model in our day-to-day. And I would say it, it was a long journey. Like it's an uphill battle getting each of our business partners to get into a tool like that, let's say at full scale. I, there are champions on the ground who are super users, absolutely. And we've had those throughout, but I would say we're building more and more super users. So that's been part of our success and has generated, which I was waiting for, the interest from the business. So I did not launch one model to the business, um, at least initially. And then we slowly kind of trickled in access over time. And we're still working on that based on honestly, like grassroots um, demand. So, or buzz, right? Marketing buzz on, on, oh, what is this cool tool that you have that has all of the information on our people in it? Yeah, yeah. Um, what, what is the cool tool? I mean, you're speaking in generalities right here, and it sounds like it's got a you know great uptake. But like, what, what does the tool provide? Yeah, I mean, we of course have our HRIS, so we use success factors, and 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 all of our information is coming from SAP or now Employee Central, so yeah. that we are HCM, HRIS, whatever we call it, and then we pull that into one model for visualizations. But we also pull in uh, all the other programs that we use um, and platforms that we use from talent acquisition, from learning, um, and let's say performance management, um, something like a degreed, right? So LXPs, not only LMSs. So you can bring it all in um, and better understand what's going on in terms of if someone is acting this way or was hired from here or behaving in a learning, like their their high, high learning focus, Mm -hmm. what else does that mean? right, in terms of their employment outcomes, let's say promotions or or just movement in the organization. So there's a lot of those analytics that we've built in one model. And of course, you know, we call them storyboards because that's the one model terminology for a dashboard. And people have then taken it upon themselves to build their own, let's say, you know, Latin America list of storyboards. So we generated those global views so people could kind of see what's going on around them. That was another way that we used one model. People didn't have access to, let's say, the global understanding um, until we brought one model in where we can create some global views without drill down, right? So from a yeah. security model perspective, it's awesome. It's very detailed. And that was one of the selling points for us. Um, so essentially democratizing yeah. you know, all this data uh, and allowing people to manipulate it on their own if they have that inclination. You guys are stunned. That's, You're stunned into silence. <laughs> well, no, we're, we're fascinated. We're like blown away. <laughs> well, I think, I mean, it, it does a tool like that help you build capability in HR people? Or how do you build capability in HR people using analytics? Yeah, I think we, we did not build capability in people just by looking at the analytics. It's, that, that didn't happen. I think we, we built some capability in terms of how to use the technology, click here and, and apply your filters, right? Um, but what we're just taking a step back now and doing, um, and we, we started this a year plus ago, is starting with why are we even doing this? What's the business question? And, and a lot of times the business doesn't have the question. So that was the other issue, I think, for some of our HR people, because I think we always said in the beginning, work with your business leader, understand the business question. They don't even know what they don't know or what they could know using talent data and how it can be connected to other outcomes, right? Other than just like putting people in the org chart, right? And getting some skills here and there. So there's a lot more, let's say advanced, even though I don't know that we would call it advanced, but from a business leader perspective, there's a lot more advanced analytics we could be doing with talent data. Um, And so now people are, for sure, understanding the value 
um, that that brings to the ta- to their you know integrity, intelligence, credibility, all these awesome things. Um, and it's not about the platform; it's about the questions that you ask um, and how you help your stakeholders understand um, what you can unlock, right, and what you can decide that's different if you have this data in front of you. You know, it's funny, um, coming back to Conference Board and Amy Armitage from earlier, uh, that's actually where, where that's where you and I met. And But I had known about you for a while because of our mutual friend, Amy Stevenson. The other Amy. So many the other Amy. And I knew Amy Armitage from Towers Perrin back in the day. So that was another connection way back when. And then, yes, Amy, our, our other mutual friend, Amy. When the three of us even got to hang out... Uh, at Talreo, uh, I guess it was the year before last, right? Always at the W, though. Let's just be Always clear. Always at the W. It's there's there's just good bars, right? W is <laughs> is reliable when it comes to bars. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so Amy and I worked together back at AIG, um, and have both gone on to I would say bigger and. and amazing things, right? As one does in their career, hopefully your career only goes right up from, from where you began. Um, (laughs) Before that I was at Deloitte. So I would say I did more people analytics work at Deloitte and then went to AIG and then moved on from there. Um, But we had, I'm so glad that I made that stop in my career because I wouldn't have met Amy. I wouldn't have met Roxanne um, also last though. So we've, we had a great time. I think that, you know, working externally also like prepares you for internal life in ways that, you know, just, D- drilling down always internally just can't right like i i meet people that uh were external consultants and they're able to just like simplify issues to the point where like it's really digestible for the client the customer yeah exactly i feel like i couldn't be a career consultant even though there's a lot of career consultants so i don't want to bash it because it's super awesome and lucrative and you get to, I don't know, learn the latest and greatest so you can sell yeah. the latest and greatest. So I do love that about it. Uh, but for me, I just, I could not see myself being that person. I needed to go internal. So it's a sales role, right? Like, yes, absolutely. It gets tiring. Also, it's like you're selling yourself internally. Yeah. When, I mean, talk about people who've mastered looking smart, but not necessarily being smart, you know? The external consultant who shows up for 10 minutes and diagnoses all your problems. Yes. <laughs> Here's a four color chart. Scott, say it again. Here's a four color chart. I'm, I'm fucking up today. Like, I gotta keep interrupting you. I apologize. <laughs> all right, here, I'll just I'll just go off. I'll just I'll just get you. Let's just talk over each other the whole time. That'll be a good one. I mean, this is the way it was when we were at uh, the W Hotel too. <laughs> exactly. So That's right. Well, I think you were on my right and Cole, you're on my oh, yeah. I can't remember. Because remember that circle couch? Yeah, it was like a circle couch with like a gold chain sort of yes. thing. Private, but not private. But it was... It was $12 beer night. You were wearing jeans, <laughs> and I was not. That, that, that tracks. People are casual, and I'm just not. I think I was wearing this, probably this Patagonia shirt, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Chances are, it probably was. Um and, and again, Courtney, we're not all Manhattanites with our fancy style and not blue jeans. Okay, but like dress for the part you want, not the part you are. I don't know. That's what I heard one time. <laughs> I think I do. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think with Scott, you're talking to the wrong person. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, my goal direction is uh, far different than other people's, clearly. Well, on your little... I don't know, rectangle where your face is. I see two directions right in the oh, direction correct logo. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 We're good. Okay. What? what do you think about the margarita green? I mean, we, we've been through a hundred of these episodes. Yeah. Is it, is it time to change the color? I'm enjoying it. I'm okay. A, I mean, okay. did one model approve that now that I'm seeing powered by one model? <laughs> I mean, they're, they are sponsoring us. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I actually don't mind the color. I like the color. Well, the the color is all us. Um, it's actually all me, but I I hate the color personally, and I chose it. <laughs> but we haven't. We've never moved away from it. We had a lot of reason. talks early on. I, I dropped the logo, and uh, Cole said it needed some uh, flair with some color. Yeah. So I chose the worst color in history. That's my bad. No. Um, not the worst. No, I like regardless. it. Regardless. 
Well, why don't we do why don't we do some confusion matrix? The confusion matrix. Real quick, we wanted to say thanks again to One Model, the AI and people analytics pioneer for sponsoring the episode. And now back to the confusion matrix. Scott, do you have something for us today? Yeah, so this is gonna be this is super random. Like I have I have two th- I have a backup plan if this doesn't work, but uh <laughs> Cool. <laughs> so you know it's gonna be good. Yeah. So this could be rough. This could be rough. Uh, we're coming up on state fair season. We state fair Texas. Uh, it's good times. It's it's known yeah, for fall. what's up? Fall. Is it because it's fall or is there no fall in Texas? You go from like summer to like you get like about a week, a week of fall, okay. then like winter for like a few days. Um, Nobody drives through Texas to admire the changing of the leaves. Let's put okay. it that way. No, no, we go straight. I knew that. I knew that part. Everything goes brown. But what the state fair is known for is its creative food options. All right, they got a new thing every year. New thing every year. So here are three foods, and your choice is to, or your task rather, is to choose the one that's real. Okay. Okay. I can do it. Easy game. Three options. Choose the one that's real. Okay. Okay. Number one. Lay's potato chip drink. Okay. Do I, I, I'm just going to listen to all of them first, right? Yeah. 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 I'm not going to give you my opinion. Okay. Who is fat bacon pickle fries, which is a lot of nouns in one word. One, one okay. Word. Fat. You, no. Can you say it again? Fat, fat bacon, bacon pickle fries. Like not bacon fat pickle fries, fat bacon. I'm not going to give anything away. Got it. You're not going to trick me like that. I don't think we're trying to trick you. I think we just want to know what you're saying. <laughs> Fat bacon pickle fries. Okay. And uh, number three, cotton candy bacon on a stick. Cotton candy. So that seems the least plausible just from a physics standpoint. Lay's potato so, chip drink, fat bacon pickle fries, and cotton candy bacon on a stick. Why is cotton candy bacon on a stick? I'm talking to Cole. Not you. Mm-hmm. Why is cotton candy bacon on a stick the least plausible? Because I it, I'm, I'm imagining it. I could be wrong about this. That you have the cotton candy, and then the bacon is wrapped around the cotton candy. And cotton candy doesn't have the constitution to hold the weight weight of bacon. If in my mind, but can it just be cotton candy flavor bacon? <laughs> oh, it could be. I could be misinterpreting what it is. And you just put a bunch of fat in there, but would that work? It probably wouldn't because cotton, to your point, cotton candy, because it's just sugar. Yeah. Couldn't hold on to the fat. It would, me- it would melt. Okay. Okay. I, like I'm, I'm getting the science behind it. As a person who's been to the Texas state fair, the, the constitution of the dish itself matters a lot because if it's just <laughs> falling off the stick, you're not going to, nobody's going to buy it. You got to be able to walk around with it clearly. Yeah, exactly. Can I make a guess? Yeah, yeah, that's that's the goal. I think number two is the right one is the one that's real. Fat bacon pickle fries. Ooh, yeah, mm-hmm. and interesting. I I'm gonna go number one just because of the marketing, <laughs> like Lay's potato chips. That sounds like something they would try to market. So I think from a capitalistic standpoint, it's number one. Uh, you're both right. All three of them are real. Oh, you see it. Okay. You sent the link. I, I sent over the link. See if you can pull this up. The cotton candy bacon on the stick. I, I watched a video on this and they have like just an immense piece of bacon and someone just in the cotton candy, you know, that weird like circular barrel is like just yeah. out cotton candy. They're just doing that. And then they take a blowtorch and kind of like caramelize the cotton candy onto the bacon strip. Wow. And so you can like bite off the bacon with the cotton candy, like in one bite. That's the point. Yeah. So like uh, the cotton candy kind of wraps around the entire thing and they just kind of caramelize the center of the bacon. So it has <laughs> kind of like, like a uh, horseshoe baldness. Like it has like this like little fluff of cotton candy around the sides of the bacon that you can eat. I see. Okay. That. I'm not sure if that sounds good or not, but the other, yeah, you're sharing it. Good job. There you go. Yeah. There's, there's lots. I mean, these are amazing. I do think fat bacon pickle fries though is it it sounds delicious actually to me. And so it must sound delicious to some other people, just bacon and pickles. Like people. Yeah. If I recall correctly, those were pickle spears with like bacon in it or something like that. Yeah. It sounds like the definition of like sweet and savory mixed together. I I think it would, 
It would actually be pretty good. I would try it in a heartbeat. But highly, highly recommend. Got to go to the State Fair of Texas. It's, it's. I know, like a lot of other states, everyone loves their State Fair, but it's not just like funnel cake and stuff. It is. It does sound great. fun. I mean, just this alone. When, when I was a kid, uh, they, they had like this big like uh, husbandry sort of area where you, like all the animals were like you, like petting zoo and this sort of thing. But they had a chicken that would play you in tic tac toe. Like you pop a quarter in, and it play <laughs> you tic tac toe, and it would win. It would win every time. How does that even happen, really? Trained a chicken. You have to be pretty bad to lose at tic tac toe. It's the first one to get three corners, right? Does the chicken memorize? I don't understand. How does well, that the, the, the tic tac toe strategy is the first one to get three corners wins. Right, but how does the? I thought chickens were stupid. I mean, <laughs> I mean, maybe this one. Chicken. <laughs> maybe maybe it's the the first one in the new evolution of chicken intelligence waiting to happen. Amazing. I don't know. Amazing. Are they just chicken? The thing that I really don't want to think about is like what did they have to do to that chicken to get it to do tic tac toe? This is all conditioning, but... right? <laughs> yeah, Hopefully. I guess so. I don't know. But maybe they put a special microchip in it. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. <laughs> like, maybe they did. And yeah, this is the next evolution of like Elon Musk vision of you know putting microchips in people i mean yeah start, start with chickens right and like then we'll move on to maybe cats plausible plausible and just teaching them progressively more complex tasks with tic-tac-toe being a you know pretty simple task and eventually they're coding on computers yeah yeah chess champions python champions just good science well i mean like apparently you don't need to be python just do excel now right as we learned earlier in the show. As we learned. Okay. Yeah. And and is Python really slowing down though? I, I okay, a couple of thoughts here. So Gen AI is definitely reducing the knowledge you need to have of coding ability, right? Like you you currently you still need to be able to yeah. code to use, say, Chat GPT, Claude, whatever, in combination. Because you need to be able to diagnose problems and be able to understand. Because it rarely comes out of the box working. Um, I I have seen uh, reports that say like R is diminishing in its uh, prevalence, which it, it is sort of a niche sort of thing for yeah. social psychologists, this sort of thing. And I think that Excel gets a bad rap because you can do a lot in Excel, especially someone that really knows it very well. Yeah. You can do all your statistical analysis. Of course, you make dashboards and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I mean, as a base skill that everyone needs to know, yeah, I, I, I that makes total sense. You need to know how to use Excel. Yeah. I mean, I think yeah. we, we would have predicted it would go, it would have gone down in popularity, but so it's just in interesting. That, again, the, I've, uh, there's a lot more interesting insights where that came from. So I've got a series of two articles coming out about it, and I'm talking about it at People in like, well, New York, so just to make a little plug there. So when is this coming yeah. out? Because you don't want to give anything away. Is this coming out in September or after the People in like, it's Yeah, I think it's coming out in September, and I think at least the first article in this series will be out by then, so it shouldn't all be... Uh, I'll be new to whoever's listening, but regardless, do you, do you have a whole section on SPSS? We track the prevalence of SPSS. Yeah, yeah, it's a part of it. MATLAB, any MATLAB in there? No, I don't think it's. I it didn't it didn't meet the criteria of being prevalent enough to be tracked. Is it Stata? I think it's Stata. It like costs so much. That it's like a yeah, billion dollars. So the biggest ones originally were SPSS and SAS. Yeah. Uh, Things like Stata and, and MATLAB and and there's a few others that are a lot less prevalent. Um, it, but yeah, those were the most common. And then they sort of got replaced by R and then eventually Python. Um, and now I think a lot of people are doing work, you know, coding directly out of, you know, GitHub Copilot and things like that. That makes sense. Yeah. Python is still like great for like manipulating data, but R is great for if you need to do any sort of like analysis. That's, yeah, you know, I would say we've dabbled in a bunch of those. Cole don't want to talk about this no more. He wants yeah. to move on. Well, let's let's do some nerdery. <laughs> the nerdery. Nerdery, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's All right. do Ner nerdery. You don't want to talk about the State Fair anymore? Okay. Let's see how it is. Or, or let's, you got more on the State Fair? <laughs> let's do it. 
Let me tell you about big techs. Let me tell you about big techs. Let's move on. Let's move on. Yeah. <laughs> we can go well, back to it. Let's How about that? We can go back. Yeah, let's, let's do something equally ab absurd. <laughs> can you guess which country swears the most? <laughs> um, China, because there's a lot of people there. Where? China. China. Oh, yeah. She's hitting us with some statistics. That it should be on a on a um, oh, world level. Th that that's a great people analytics point. You know, it's like not she's going with like sheer volume, right? Not yeah. sheer yeah. volume, not, not prevalence. Yeah, not per capita. So according to this analysis, it looks like it's actually on a per capita basis, not not China. China is pretty far down there. Yeah, uh, but maybe they get. In we got the top ten here. So you've got United States is number one and by a good healthy margin because it's almost twice as prevalent as the next country, which is United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Mexico, Jamaica, Colombia, Dominican Republic, and Egypt. Closing Egypt. Us out. Wow. Egypt. And in fairness, this is uh, the number of tweets per 1,000 that contain a swear word. Oh, it's based on tweets. Okay. I can't read. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. I mean, I I also really enjoy swearing personally, <laughs> um, and I do so frequently, not on this podcast, but frequently outside. You know, <laughs> you have a favorite. Um, I mean, I like like you're you're trying like the f bomb is really. I don't yeah. really want. I don't want to go there as much as I do, but then I I end up going there. That's a staple. That's it a just staple. just rolls off the tongue. It really does, and I'm from. The New York area, and it's just it goes with the territory. Are are there any sort of like New York specific like swears? Like uh, they they called me a jabroni, and I was like, I I would be offended if I knew what this meant, but I have no idea what you're talking about. I don't know what that is either. I was gonna say in New York, there's things that are more of like the dialects of the languages that are there, and so I don't even know if it's a made up word in another language just because they're in New York, right? Or if it's actually a legit word in whatever brazil so this is really surprising that you guys don't know that that was the main word that the rock used in wrestling he called people jabronis and what does it mean oh, what does it mean i don't think I, I actually think it's a made up word to be honest with you but oh, that was his like tagline phrase because i don't think it actually is a curse word but you can call somebody that and it offends them for some reason so I, he would always call people yo jabroni <laughs> that was his big thing I feel I feel better and like even more superior than the person that called me that online. Yeah. I mean, the rock is involved, so that's cool. Yeah. Well, and then I think this might be the reason why you, you found this one, Scott, but they also go by the different cities. They go by city, in, yeah. In, yeah, with the highest prevalence. Um, and since the United States is the highest, the highest in the, in, the, in North America is Baltimore, followed by Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Really? And, um, and I, I promise you, because I think this is probably not the first time somebody has done this analysis, and I don't think it made the cut because it's not big enough, but I've seen an analysis before that showed that my hometown in Louisiana had the highest prevalence of any city in the United States for curse words. And so seeing Baton Rouge there is not surprising to me at all. Do you tweet a lot? Because of course, like, let's think of this statistically. Is it, what's the denominator within each, like it's this Baton Rouge tweet a lot, you know what I'm saying? When they do, when they do. I mean, you're, you're talking 7% of tweets contain a curse word, it seems high, right? That's pretty high. Yeah, 7% <laughs> really high. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I. I on a, on a global scale, here's a people analytics point: is like, what are we really measuring here? Are are we measuring swear likelihood, or are we measuring like freedom of speech, or or perceptions of freedom of speech? Do you feel like that you can tweet unencumbered or with no social ramifications? Yeah, I mean, it's a great point because it's online. Yeah, it's not well, just in. Yeah. When I go to say the UK, I mean they take swearing to another level, man. Like it is unreal. Yeah. C bombs. You're like, oh my lord. I like it there. I like, I like all of that. But <laughs> they have like a much more reserved sort of uh, demeanor to them, where 
perhaps we don't do that online. Yeah. I want to come back to this point, Scott, though, about the freedom of speech. I would have never thought about that in relationship to this, but I, I wonder, because if you do look at the cities that have the top amount of swearing, it's places that aren't very economically vibrant. Yeah. And so maybe it's like, Hey, if I don't worry, if I'm ever going to get a job or a raise out of my Twitter yeah. account, I'll just swear away. <laughs> Right. But if, if it's, you know, like in a place that I think is pretty economically vibrant and this might come back and bite me in the ass, my future career prospects, you know, eh, maybe yeah. I'll, you know, censor myself a little more. Yeah. That, that's just sort of a different angle there. Like it's, it, it is freedom in the sense that like, well, I'm going to have no ramifications for this. So I'm going to do whatever I want. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. That, that has to play into it because you're putting yourself out there and it's forever. Internet is forever as we remind our children. Is it though? Like you're seeing, starting to hear some of this It's called the, the internet dark ages where like uh, <laughs> companies are like uh, wiping away content and this sort of thing. So we think that it's going to last forever. And like our grandkids, grandkids are going to be like, well, Cole Napper, there he is sitting there. My great grandpappy podcast <laughs> in a way, but like, I don't know if it actually will be around forever. Yeah, I don't know. It's horrible or anything, but they're called the internet dark ages. Well, I think one of the things that we're figuring out is that, you know, storing data, even though incredibly cheap, still has a cost. Yeah. And the rate of data growth is, you know, my understanding is, is exponential. And so that means the cost growth of storing all that data is exponential. So, it almost makes good business sense to just purge some of this stuff. Yeah. And I think it also affects kids that grow up, you know, nowadays is like, you know, when you were 12 years old and you said something stupid, it didn't follow you around when you were 30, but now, now it does. It's just know? a rumor. It's just a rumor. What I did in high school. It's not, yeah. you know, no one can prove it. Yeah. There's no proof. No, there's no proof. There's no proof whatsoever. Uh, like what, what happens to your uh, Google account when you die? You know, like all those Google photos, or like uh, Instagram. Eventually, Instagram is going to meet a demise, I imagine. Like the life cycle of companies is not forever. Yeah. No, it's, a, it's a super interesting point. Are we, when things don't follow you around or things didn't follow us around when we were younger, we're at the other end of the pendulum right now or the uh, complete extreme, right? So it has to go back at some point. You'll see people like Ray yeah. Coles or things they tweeted like 10 years ago, i.e. right back to this article. Uh, yeah. So be careful out there. <laughs> but if you're in Baltimore or Baton Rouge, you don't give a crap. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't matter. That's cool. Just tweet well, away. <laughs> I mean, there, there's definitely, I mean, there's lots of different, like you said, inferences on whatever people's feeling about their career prospects, but it's also the freedom of speech part as well. I mean, it's, there's there's good things and bad and bad things that we can imply from that. I wonder why New York is not there. I I, I, put, I put it away. I can pull it back up, but I don't believe they were in the top ten. No. Right. I didn't. I actually couldn't see because I didn't put my glasses on. But I would have assumed. But I guess there's so much tweeting from New Yorkers because there's so many people. Again, thinking about the statistical likelihood, because um, New Yorkers curse all the time. I mean, there's that. I don't know. Like it was some cartoon where the per this is I don't know. Maybe it was in the New York Times where the person is saying "fuck you" to another guy and thinking in their head, "How are you?" Right? Like, great to see you. And that was in New York. And then in L.A., the person was saying, "Hi, how are you?" And I said, "See you." But in their head, they were thinking, "Fuck you." It was like, it's I'm just glad we got you to curse. It's we got annoying. we got Courtney. We <laughs> I'm actually only citing an, an article that I saw in the New York Times. So, well, I have, the same, I have the same reaction to like someone honking. You know, it's like if I'm from the South, you don't honk at people, you get shot for honking at people. Mm. But like you go to like Philly, somewhere like that, the honking is just a hey, I'm here. Don't don't come in my lane. You know, it's not. Yeah, a big exactly. Deal. And it's like that in New York and India. I mean, it's yeah. like constant, and it's a nice thing. It's like beep beep, I'm here. Don't hit me. I don't want to hit you. It's not rude at all. Murder you. I get the same thing with like the little freaking lime scooters. People like ding ding on the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. God, I want to like knock them off their little scooter. I, I was up in Seattle a few weeks ago, actually, when Scott was out of town. And man, those lime scooters are everywhere there. It was obnoxious. 
it's like the delivery people in Manhattan. It is actually a, a almost like fatalistic thing to walk out into a bike lane because they come out of nowhere so fast. It might not be the Lime scooters, but it's just anyone on a electric something in these bike lanes. Why are bicyclists so angry? Like they they seem to be the most angry people I've ever seen in my life. They they protect that yeah. bike lane. <laughs> I don't disagree with that. Yeah, no, I think so. I think you're right. There is an anger. I think if you're a person who has a chip on their shoulder already, you become a bicyclist, not oh. the other way around. Oh. That is, that's a theory. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You were born into life. The life didn't call you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it is a calling of sorts. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot around here. Are there a lot around you all? Bicyclists? Yeah. <laughs> oh, in Seattle, definitely. We got bike lanes. It, it's not out of control like it is in uh, New York, though. I mean, I'm in Connecticut, FYI. Okay. There's a lot around here. Yeah, we have the ones that ride on like Saturday and Sunday mornings in those big packs and take exactly. over. Exactly. You know, yeah, the road and everything, but uh, not not a lot of everyday bicyclists where where I live. You gotta like navigate a Peloton while you're just like going to the donut shop. I have to plug my cousin who owns a bike company in Chattanooga, Tennessee, in the south. Well, well, that's that's more mountain biking. Like that would be a fun place to bike, to be honest. Yeah, with you. I mean, it's he does road bike tours, but also probably mountain bike tours as well. It's called Bellevue. View. Uh, I went nice. on one in California. So he has them. He used to actually be in Texas. He used to live in Austin and had a lot of maybe not hilly bike tours going on around there. But now, yeah, to your point in Chattanooga, it's more hilly. Yeah. Well, why don't we, um, why don't we move to the, the next one? Scott, do you want to tee this up about the interview cycle times? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so have y'all ever been through a super lengthy interview process? We're talking about interview cycle times, like interview for a job. What are we talking about? Yeah. 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 So okay, like, okay, okay. you apply to job offer. Okay. My longest, which I actually took this job, um, I started interviewing July 5th because I remember it was the day after July 4th. What job? The job I you got, have now? No, not the job I have now. I'm not going to say which employer it was. Okay. Um, but I, I started interviewing on July 5th and I got a job offer in November. And wow. that was forever. <laughs> it was, yeah. Wouldn't encourage it. I... When I was in grad school, I'd pass comps. I was looking for that, you know, job out of the school. Uh, I began interviewing with a company. Uh, it rhymes with Porn Fairy. We interviewed with them from like January to <laughs> May, and they eventually never gave. They were like, "Ah, oh, no, rejected you." Put me through like twelve interviews, and like I must have oh. spent like twenty hours with these motherfuckers. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, Are you I'm sure sorry you really that you it? endured that. That does really sound. Uh, uh, at, at the end, I was like, I raised like, do you want me to be the fucking CEO? Like, what is yeah. going on here? That is not people centric. Do you like me? Just. <laughs> what do you not like? Why do we keep yeah, yeah. talking? What don't you like? Who? What is the issue? Or just cut me loose. Just cut me loose. Let me live my life. Man. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't like me, then don't like me. Whatever you want. But. On the short end here, uh, apparently you can get a job at McDonald's in about five days, which I'm, I'm sure they have super high staff turnover. And Yeah, so there's some desperation there. You don't need a whole lot of training and a whole lot of screening. Uh, and the FBI, on the other hand, what's that, 39 days? That actually seems short. That's really short. That seems short. Totally. They must have like pre-screen these dudes, right? For the government versus corporate America, I mean, I think that's very short. I was actually pretty pleased to see that it was like the FBI and the IRS and the Air Force had some of the longer ones. I was like, yeah, those make sense to take a little bit longer. You know, measure twice, cut once when it comes to selecting those folks, though. Measure twice, cut once. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. I'm going to use that? that, too. No, what does it mean, though? That's in refer, like, that's a very common, like, carpenter-like language. Yeah. Oh, yes. Measure... Okay, so I have heard it in that context. Okay. I like it. Yeah, I'm gonna use it. And then we, that's that's a good saying just for like people analytics too. I like. Isn't that. it? I'm not. I'm trying to apply it. Let's apply it. 
Tom. Yeah, it's like, hey, like, uh, check your work, check your work, and then move on. Make the cut and move on. Like, there's no need to. You guys are late to the party. I've been using that for ten years. <laughs> I say it all the time. Goddamn hipster call, hipster call. Yeah. People like hipster. Uh, Meta, on the other hand, uh, they did also tech companies here. Uh, Meta has twenty days. Yeah. I hear cool things about Meta too. Like once you get on the job, they give you the first 90 days to kind of you're you're hired, you're getting paid, all this sort of stuff. But you have 90 days to just kind of feel your way around and find the team that you like and you know, see where you fit in and you know, go join that team and move on through life. I feel like that's probably like Google's twenty percent time where they got like a day a week that that um, they could work on like anything they wanted, and then it went away yes. eventually. I, I bet you that went away at Meta already. Oh, did they take it away? Yeah, it 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 quietly went away, just like the concept of "Don't do evil" or whatever went away too. <laughs> that was like your tagline. Yeah, we can't live into this one. <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah, I think uh, so. The the shortest tech company hiring time was Uber at nine days, and then the longest was Oracle at twenty five days. Don't these people need background checks? I mean, the, a background check is two weeks. I'm thinking. Well, I think to Uber. be fair, I think they're talking about like Uber drivers. Uber, um, yeah, yeah. That's not corporate. Well, if it's not corporate, then it, that's not a fair comparison. I, yeah. they, they have Amazon on that list too. So if they're including f uh, fulfillment center workers, that's not the same either. Uh, over here, they have uh, restaurants, and they had fries listed as a restaurant. So I don't think they actually know what <laughs> fries is. <laughs> Yeah, that's an electronic store for sure. But I think the the longest restaurant, the longest restaurant was still pretty quick, which was ten days. It was Dutch Brothers Coffee, um, and then I think some of the shorter ones were like Jimmy John's and Sonic and Papa John's were all like less than five days. Wow, we, we've talked about this before, but uh, and Cole and I took a very similar strategy when applying for jobs. Just kind of keep a tracking list of all the things you apply for. Like mm -hmm. you know, what it was for, kind of how much yeah. you like it, all, all, all this sort of stuff. But I, I found that if they didn't call me back within four days, it just wasn't going to happen. Just high, high likelihood of them ever reaching out. Might, might as well go to zero. And I even had one. And again, I uh, actually ended up taking this job, much to my chagrin. Um called me six months after i applied mm -hmm. and ended up getting that job it was the wildest thing wow yeah so you were yeah. in their resume database like they say that they put you in well to be fair i think what happened is they went through like the interview cycle process like seven times okay didn't end up getting somebody <laughs> and then found me because i'm always somebody's last fucking choice <laughs> so you know i don't like, know that is not okay true. fine fine we'll call cole fine yeah Finally, finally got to the, the dummy, uh, you know, anyway. I, mean, I haven't searched for a job since before COVID because that's the last time I moved was Colgate. So is it, I mean, on, so I'm looking, I'm thinking about Richard Rosenau's one model blog, right? With all the, the links, which is an incredible resource. I've sent it to so many people in the field and I know people are getting jobs that way. Is that the main way people are getting jobs at this point? Are people, people just applying or is it the networking thing? <laughs> it's gotta be networking, right? Yeah. But it seems like it's applying. Well, here's the thing. So the guy that he's a chief people officer at Coinbase the other day, and they had made some pretty public proclamations about how they had to, um, how they changed up all of their hiring practices and some were considered somewhat controversial, even though I think they were pretty basic. It was like, have assessments. It's like, well, that seems pretty basic. Um, but one of them was that they, they, they were bragging that 20% of their hires came from people who applied online. And like, this is so high, 20% <laughs> come from so applying amazing. online. And I was like, are you kidding me? I bet you most people don't see that as high. Right. I think they all. see that as incredibly low. Yes. I, I, would, I, I don't know. I, I would love to see the stats here because who knows what you get online? I mean, it's probably just like a trash bin of people all over the place trying to apply for jobs no matter what, right? Right. Trying to weed through that, which, which I mean, 
uh, automatic um, resume scoring and all that sort of stuff is like super valuable in this case because recruiters' time has got to be inundated with <laughs> non-qualified folks. Yeah, which is where AI comes in. Yeah. Right? But sure. I would hope that we would be considering people who are applying to our job. I mean, in, in the world at large, not necessarily Colgate, but that's at least what people analytics hopefuls are are going to the website for, you know, to the one model blog to see, okay, what's available. I mean, it's obviously an awesome tool just to understand the market and how it's shifting and are the roles senior, are the roles junior, you know, how are they expanding into more like at HR tech or are they less technical? I think it's an awesome piece of, you know, data that we can dig into that way. Yeah. But I mean, I'm telling people to apply yeah. through these yeah. links. Well, I'll, I'll tell you this, and Scott, to your point about, you know, it would be a great research study for some aspiring PhD student to figure out like what proportion of people who apply versus who network versus any other way you can get a job and do some kind of study. That would be fascinating. I would love to cover it on this podcast for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Scott, find a friend. Yeah. Find a friend to talk about it. I don't got yeah. friends. I don't got friends. Well, you, you have IO friends. Don't you go to PSYOP? You both go to PSYOP, don't you? I love PSYOP. We're coming up on a uh, uh, submission deadline. It's still, by, by the time this is released, it's like about 20 days away, something like that. Uh, but starting to do all that sort of planning. And then, like, the last week's just like frantic, free for all of yeah. trying to figure that's, it all out. One of the worst feelings in the world is knowing that the deadline's getting there and your, your submission is you've only gotten the title <laughs> you're like oh god you got a I gotta title get and you gotta dig up like three panelists to fill gaps and you're like oh no <laughs> like, who am i gonna call so i'm mad at syap and i haven't been in a long time it's in denver next year right correct correct um i mean that would be a good one but they i had i think submitted not on my own but through groups two panels and guess what Neither was accepted. You didn't make the cut. It's, no. it's 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 a mixed blessing. Not getting accepted is a, it, it feels bad, but getting accepted is also like, God damn it! Now I got to. I'm angry. So it's one of the panels was about how I think it was something about people analytics coming from different disciplines. Freaking cool discussion. It was people analytics yeah. focused. So maybe that was part of. It. Maybe there were too many. Maybe there were too many people analytics focused topics. I was angry though. I didn't feel bad. I just feel like mad. Those two things are different. Yeah. These are viewers. They don't know the value that they just. Exactly. The exactly. The stereotypical right. reviewer number two with their hot take comments about how dumb your paper is. I'm annoyed you know? about yeah. it. <laughs> well, um, I, I got one, one quick uh, nerdy article left and then we can, we can wrap this thing up. Um, so it was just, I thought this was fascinating. And, and Courtney, because I know that your team does some survey research that you would probably find this interesting as well. Okay. So a friend of mine, uh, Ludic Stelic, uh, he, he, he was independent for a long time, but now he's at Sanofi, um, did some research to show who is it, it, like what is their engagement of who fills out comments on surveys? Is it just the people who are mad? Is it okay. just the people who are happy? And what he found consistently um, via doing um, some modeling, I'm not going to get into the details of here, but we have the link in the show notes, um, is that it's actually, if you use, um, which I wouldn't necessarily recommend this, but if you use kind of a net promoter score 10 point scale, it's actually the people who are most likely to comment are in the, the two to three range. Mm -hmm. The people who are least likely to comment are in the seven to nine range, but people who are a zero or a 10 are almost equivalently likely to comment. And, and if you're kind of in that, that um, so it, if you're extremely dissatisfied, you're not necessarily going to comment. If you're extremely satisfied, you're going, you're more likely to comment than somebody who's just moderately satisfied. So I thought, I thought this was pretty interesting stuff. I would not have, have guessed. I would not have hypothesized that at all. I mean, I think most people would think it's one or the other people who are really angry, right? That's what I think the, the going kind of common knowledge or at least common thinking is that people who are pissed off, right. Mm -hmm. Are the ones that are going to comment versus the higher. 
Yeah. I think it's fair to say it is people who are pissed off, but it's people who aren't so pissed off they've thrown in the towel. Right. If you're a true zero, you're just like, ah, screw this place. I'm not even going to Forget call it. it. And I don't even bother. Um, yep. I'm sure you do the same thing with like restaurant ratings too, right? Like if you love it, maybe give them five stars. If you hate it, maybe you don't even bother, right? But if you just, eh, it's okay. And like, it was good, but they had some service issues. Yeah, and sometimes I don't want to bring them down. Maybe there was, it was an off situation. Like I yeah. had a hotel recently. It was an off situation. And it's. I, I think it could have been good without that situation. Construction, not, you know, not under their control. There, there was an article. I think it was like, oh, boy, Roscoe 2015, something like that. And he talked about the problem that we have in people on like I.O., as far as like who responds to our surveys and he essentially found that only high conscientious folks will respond to surveys so we build all mm -hmm. these models and all of our theories and you know all of our insights on a subset of the population who will actually answer surveys and you are not getting a complete picture of what people actually think my husband will never respond to a survey yeah i mean he'll never do it i agree we should we should make we should force everyone to fill out surveys and remove their freedom I agree. <laughs> well, <laughs> there's ways to do that, right? You just don't allow people to to go forward in whatever they're trying to do online until they fill it out. <laughs> I mean, is there? Can you think of any format where 100 percent of people provide feedback? You know, is is that common at all anywhere? You have to be bribed. A format. Actually, I take that back. I do remember there was one of the big tech companies was forcing all the employees to take their surveys. And there was even this guy I remember who was like trying to make every other company do that too. And it's like, if we don't have a hundred percent of the people take our surveys, you know, I was like, man, that seems pretty, uh, oh, you know, heavy handed. Do they like applicants? I wonder what the response rate for applicants is because they are highly motivated. Say, say you got to take like a psychometric exam or something like that. Mm -hmm. And there's a, you know, eh, how do we do sort of question at the end. I wonder what response rates those are. Yeah, exactly. If you're applying to a job, I mean, we have candidate survey, but it's after the yeah. we've already, right? Had yeah, it's a best practice to do it after the position is closed, because if you wait, if, <laughs> you're going to get extremely inflated scores. You need right. a motivated you have, uh, population. You need a motivated population to do it. Yeah. But it would be good to put that that survey dashboard in front of your executives. Like, man, we're doing a great job. Look how much our candidate, how great our candidates feel. Right. But then, how many of those are like four, 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 four down the line? Right. It's like nobody's really. Oh, the, there, there's a package for that. Uh, the careless package in R that'll get rid of uh, uh, people that do like designs on the survey response. Oh, really? Designs? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Like they can essentially, it shows the intercorrelation of the items. It's like, yeah, this person is not responding in a way that is realistic. That's actually good to know that there's a package in R for that. I mean, I think it's worth looking mm -hmm. into. He's, I uh, want to uh, say, a I might be making this up. Didn't Keith McNulty make that package? It was not Keith McNulty. He, uh, no. He's a friend of someone that we know. Uh, I can't okay. his name right now. I see him at PSYOP every year. Okay. Yeah. I wrote that down. Like talk about a you know low lift high impact package like that's that's awesome totally yeah well I think I think we've kind of run our course here Courtney it's been fantastic having you on the pod and so much it's been fun fantastic on the pod. being friends uh, Scott any final words for Courtney before we give her the final word Courtney I can't wait to uh, sit on a weird circular couch and uh, drink twelve dollar <laughs> beers with you again it's gonna be with great. gold beads gold beads <laughs> yeah, yeah gold beads. And let's talk about betta fish actually a little bit more next time. I think that once we get to the morning, who knows what's going to happen? Definitely. Exactly. And I don't really know anything about your aquarium because I came in late. I'll, I'll wear my I'll wear my performance jeans again next time. <laughs> my, my, my my sport Patagonia sport Patagonia. All right. Well, that's where that's We're where we get need some to help. be next. Uh, well, actually, no, that's not going to be until yeah. next year. So we need to see each other before that. And Cole, I'm going to see you before too long, and we'll see each other virtually. And then, Scott, when am I going to see yeah. you? You got to invite me out to Palmolive. 
Colgate Palmolive. Yeah, yeah. Or, you have to stay the or if you, you get over your hatred of PSYOP, you could see him next year at PSYOP. When is it, April? April. Yeah, it's usually, I don't know the exact dates, but it's usually in April sometime. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Denver. All right. Yeah. All right, until well, then. We'll see you there. We'll make it happen. Thank you so much. All right. Well, you've been listening to Direction to Correct, a People Linux podcast with Colin Scott and today's guest, Courtney McMahon. Thanks for joining us, Courtney. Thanks. Thanks, both of you. Have a good weekend. Direction and Correct is dedicated to you, our listeners, to help educate and entertain you on how to effectively do people analytics. By supporting this podcast, you are helping us continue to provide valuable insights and knowledge to our listeners. Please consider becoming a patron of the podcast. You can find the link to sign up in the show notes or at patron.podbean.com slash Thanks for your support.